you sometimes have to go through, you know, like talk to a couple of different mates before mm. someone will understand. Yeah. As well. Like that's something that, you know, I really struggled with and I actually lost a, a quite a large chunk of my friends when I was going through, especially the depression side of things. Mm. Um, so yeah, just remember that, you know, one of your friends, while they kind of may want to help, they might not know how to, but don't let that be a reflection on you. Hey guys, and welcome to season three, episode five of Couch in the Mind, clearing the mind when couch talk at the time. On today's episode, I've got Scott Martin joining me in conversation revolving around the topic of roll with the punches. How's it going, brother? Yeah, pretty good. Thanks, bro. How are you going? Oh, mate, as I was saying before, it's it's pretty crazy on the uh, the calls at the moment. For, for people that don't know what I do at the moment for work, I'm actually taking calls for the government. Um, taking the uh the COVID calls but it's really hard at the moment because restrictions are constantly changing so it's it's hard to get that end result for people but you know it's it's all about trying to find something that they can work toward but um how about yourself Matt? Yeah um so I work for a software company yep um yeah I'm just in customer support at the moment so um yeah I get pretty smashed on the phones and with emails as well pretty hectic day i wonder what what do you find more brutal the the emails or the the phone calls probably the emails yeah because uh they're constant they like my inbox never goes quiet always busy you reckon people more volatile over over the text than than you know than verbalizing it yeah depends who they are eh? <laughs> you have some interesting ones that you get some interesting emails and people can be pretty straight up and blunt. And then um, I generally find that they actually better over the phone. Eh? Yeah, true. Okay. But uh, the reason why I'm here with you today, Scotty, is because with this episode of uh, the topic of roll with the punches, the, the description of that, and I, th- I feel like it resonates with you personally, is you know, we all go through things in life and I think it's about acknowledging it at times, you know, we, we have times where we have to wean and mourn and, and vent about it, a certain situation, but eventually we have to learn to, to roll the punches and move on. Um, and, you know, there's a, there's a few things that you've gone through um, and I won't, I won't list them now, I'll speak about them as we go, but I think it's a, it's a big factor for everyone in general, just to learn to, to acknowledge it, to talk about it and then find that point where they need to learn to move on from it. Yeah, definitely. I think that's something that I've definitely learned, um, you know, over my journey. Um, yeah, I didn't really used to, you know, give up on things easily, mm. but now I'm like, oh, just go with it. Life will be sweet. Yeah, and for yourself, when you were younger, Scotty, did you did you incorporate such a mindset? Nah, definitely not. I was, you know, completely the opposite. Eh? Like, I used to get kind of wound up about everything and, yeah, just used to let things really get to me. Whereas now, nah, not so much. Yeah, absolutely. But what you're saying now, not so much, what what made you make the change? You know, it's easy, it's easy for you to think that now, but for people who may be trying to get to that point, how did you how did you make the change? I think it all depends what you go through as well. Um, I think I kind of just like I reached a point where I was like, I've got to do something about this. If I don't, you know, change something, then I'm just going to keep on going the way I'm going. Mm. Yeah, no, exactly right. I think we all have to to like you said, reach that point where we where we have to, you know, have that self realization moment where, yeah, like what what we're doing right now isn't working. You know, we've got to break the pattern and we've got to try and make some sort of change within ourselves. Um, and it's just about acknowledging that. Do you think the biggest thing is to try and is, is self-acknowledgement? Yeah, definitely. I, yeah, sure. Is. Yeah. And, and for yourself, how did you, how did you get to that? How, how did you manage to do that though? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. Oh, I think it was probably once I got diagnosed with cancer, I was like, okay, I can't let this kind of eat me up. Mm. I've just, you know, got to kind of roll with it and hope for the best and yeah. Yeah, and because you, you were just mentioning it before you got diagnosed with cancer and it was, 
when when you went through that process, I think it was in 2019, did, did that kind of wake you up? Because I feel like at times it takes something so dramatic and so negative to happen in our life to actually wake us up from the inside and go, holy shit, we need a, I actually need to make some sort of difference. Yeah, definitely. That was yeah, kind of the wake up call moment for me. Um, as soon as I got that diagnosis, I was like, okay, shit, kind of can't keep going. Mm. How I am, um, you know, something's got to change and I'm just going to, yeah, live live life a little bit and not get so wound up about things. Yeah, exactly right. And what what was it like for you, Scotty, when you when you heard the news and, and how did you actually come about getting checked up? Yeah, so that, that was actually a interesting kind of thing. Um, I just happened to be home sick from work. Um, I was working for Air New Zealand at that point still. Yeah. Um, yeah, I was just home homesick. Was feeling really tired and just kind of like drained and um, just didn't have any energy. Mm. I was like, nah, I'll take a sick day. Um, I think I kind of rolled out of bed at like lunchtime or something like that. Um, which is not like me. I'm normally out like six thirty, seven. I hardly ever sleep in. Um, yeah, and just just jumped in the shower. I think I was like, I must have been feeling really cold or something. So yeah, just jumped in the shower, try and you know warm up and wake up a bit. And yeah, for some reason, I don't know. I just checked. Whereas I've never checked in my life before this day. So yeah, I just had this kind of random feeling, and then um, yeah, checked and kind of felt a lump, and I was like, okay, holy shit, this isn't, mm. you no, know, this isn't good. Um, yeah, and I just I just had a gut feeling from like that point on that it wasn't going to be good. Yeah, and yeah, it turned out to to be cancer. It's it's crazy how like moments like that where you you just you, this for yourself it was like one of the first time times that you actually checked you know you you were feeling unwell you were just just supposedly having to have a shower and you managed you just happened to check your testicle to see that there's a lump there and then from there it led on to to being testicular cancer you know but for for yourself and for others maybe listening in. You know, how important is it just to to regularly check up? Yeah, I'd say it's it's bloody important to do it. Um, I should have started doing it ages ago. Shouldn't mm. have left it to that day. Um, yeah, definitely check. Um, it can change so quick as well. Uh, I've had a couple of scares since too. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's kind of like another wake up call. You're like, oh shit. You know, this could come back and hit me again. So yeah, definitely important to check. Do you do you think that as guys? Because I don't know, we 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 hold that masculine sort of persona about us, where we where we think that if we do go get checked up, that we're weak, or our mates will look at us and laugh, or going, "Oh, look at him, he's going to get his balls checked, and the doctor's fondling with him, and <laughs> you know, <laughs> like stuff like that." Do you think that's probably one of the reasons as to why we probably don't regularly check? Yeah, definitely. Eh? Like I was exactly like that. And, you know, I felt felt like that. And yeah, but I don't know why on this particular day, once, you know, once I checked, I was like, okay, shit, I've got to do something about it. Mm. Like, let's not leave it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and now that now that you've gone through, I guess you could say at that time it was, it, it was a, pretty negative experience but i feel like it in one sense it's it's woken you up and i, I would assume that in in certain situations you would be making the most out of life uh, a lot more than what you would have done in the past yeah definitely it um it definitely changes your outlook on life um yeah you kind of think life's all sweet until you get a diagnosis like that mm. um yeah it was a huge wake up call and I think it was a little bit difficult for me when I got the diagnosis because I was actually by myself. I didn't have oh, anyone no. with me, um, which I probably should have. Um, yeah, but I think since then, I've just learned to kind of enjoy life. Mm. Um, spend a lot of time with my mates. All my mates kind of mean the world to me. I'm mm. pretty close with, with a lot of them. Um, 
yeah, and I used to spend more time with my family as well. Uh, they live about four and a half hours from me, so I don't actually get to see them too often. Yeah. Uh, so I've kind of been making an effort, especially this year, um, to try and get up there a bit more, and that started coming down a bit more as well. So it's been, yeah, really good. Let's let's go back a bit in time. Um, you know, something else you have gone through, which is, you know, it was quite traumatic. Uh, in 2013, you were diagnosed with Crohn's disease. Now, do you mind explaining to, to people what that is and how you found out about this? Yeah, so it's something that I guess I didn't really know about until I got diagnosed with it. I'd never actually heard of it. Um, and I'm kind of picking that most people probably haven't heard of it. Yeah, I, honestly, honestly, mate, I am I'm oblivious. I'm I'm keen to keen to learn. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, basically, um, it's kind of like inflammation of like your digestive tract. Yep. So pretty much anywhere from your mouth right down to the other end, and uh, the body kind of attacks itself. So it's it's classed as an autoimmune disease. Some of it can be diet related. Uh, you can kind of control it with diet sometimes if you're lucky. Like for me, I'm lucky. Mine's all pretty much managed by diet. I do take some medication. Mm. Um, there's a lot of people I know that are way worse off than me. Like they have operations all the time and but to the digestive tract removed. And well, wow. yeah, so I'm, I'm relatively lucky. And mate, was it, was it a, just a, a random lucky occurrence that you you checked yourself up similar to to when you went to get yourself checked up with your t- and you found out that you had testicular testicular cancer no nah, not really because i'd kind of had symptoms for a while mm. um but it kind of it presents itself differently in different people um but normally it's kind of starts off like food poisoning symptoms yeah right so it's really hard to actually work out what it is. And it took the doctors quite a few months to actually figure out that mm. that's exactly what it was. Um, I keep going to the doctor and like, oh, I don't feel very well. I've got a sore stomach. And they're like, oh, nah, you'll be all right. And then- So they, so, like, so they didn't even know themselves. No, nah, well, this was just my, my normal GP. And she's like, oh, nah, you'll be right. <laughs> and then one weekend i think i ended up in hospital because i had like really Shit. bad stomach pains yeah, yeah and then um yeah it kind of just went from there if we fast forward a couple of years from big diagnosed with crohn's disease uh i i did re- recall you saying that you expressed to me that you suffered mentally with depression and anxiety now how did you learn how to alleviate these symptoms over time yeah that was a tricky one yeah um I think, you know, I really did struggle to deal with the symptoms. And then, yeah, things kind of, you know, they did get really bad mm. and then pretty much had a complete breakdown. Yeah, so I so started seeing a psychiatrist um, who then referred me to a psychologist. So I started working with her. Yep. And, um, yeah, that's when things started to change. Yeah, It took me, I think it was the second psychologist I saw to kind of, find that she was the one for me mm. she's awesome and i've actually just started seeing her again the the biggest step is is acknowledgement knowing that like being the person to put their hand up and say look i need to i need to reach out you know whether it be seeing a psychologist or a health professional or just speaking out to a family friend or or loved one it, it that taking that step is it's a difficult thing to do scotty how did you manage to go you know what, fuck it. I don't care if this isn't the thing that men and blokes are stereotyped to be doing, but I'm going to just do it anyway to, to benefit my own self. Yeah, definitely. It was, um, yeah, it wasn't until I reached out that I started yeah. you know, to feel better and, yeah, I guess learn some coping strategies as well. Yeah, and what, what sort of coping strategies have you learned over time? Um, yeah, so the psychologist kind of taught me through like breathing exercises and... I guess just not to, you know, kind of get as wound up mm. about stuff that I used to. Yep. And when you're saying wound up, what what sort of 
So like you would get agitated over the smallest of things. Yeah, you just get kind of real agitated and like grumpy and start snapping at anyone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I know what you mean, man. I know what you mean. You go to that, uh, what's it called, that simmering phase where you've had onto things and you just blow up and, and uh, the rest is history. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> and and from, for where, from where you were to where you are now, can you, if you actually took a step back and actually had a look at your journey, can you see that you're a different person, you know, from the things you've gone through, even though at times are very negative, but from those negative times, you've learned so much out of yourself. Do you see a change in you? Yeah, definitely a big change. Eh? Um, I used to kind of be this really quiet person who didn't really say boo, mm. um, unless I was around the people that I kind of knew. Um, but now, like, you can hardly shut me up. I'm always talking. <laughs> <laughs> Scotty, mate, I'll, I may as well hand you the mic. You can interview me. <laughs> <laughs> and for, I'm, I'm curious to know, Scotty, because, yeah, I, fa- I found um, you reached out to me after I interviewed Lockie Stewart. Um, do you find, uh, like, men's performance coaches to be useful to yourself? Yeah, I think they are, you know, like really useful. I'm really keen to do it. I was actually just talking to um, a guy earlier who who reached out on Instagram and um, he's actually part of Lockie's group. Um, yeah. So he's just giving me a bit of insight into you know, what they do. And um, yeah, so it's something I'm really keen to get into now. I think it's so important, like I was just saying before, that you do find your niche. Like you were saying, you haven't you haven't actually personally tried out the men's talking group. It might work for you and it might not work for you. But like you were saying before, when he went and reached out to that first psychologist to speak about some of the things that you were holding on to and they were having a hindrance on you, that particular person wasn't the right match. Then you went and explored to find another person and you found a relatability and you found comfort with that person. So I think it's so important just being able to find a talking group a psychologist, a mate you can talk to or a family member where you feel uh, you're most comfortable to be able to talk about anything that might be on your mind. Yeah, definitely. You've got to, you've got to gel with the person. I was lucky, I guess, because the second psychologist was the right person for me. Mm. Um, I've heard of some people going through like five or six. Mm. Um before they find the person that you know they kind of gel with but yeah it's it's hugely important if you don't find the person that you kind of gel with then I don't reckon you're going to open up as much Mm. and get as much out of it so I'm curious to know Scotty because I I I personally haven't gone through that experience of having to to, to seek another person to speak and open about some of the things I may have gone through at a certain point in time. But for people listening in who may be going through that pattern right now, do you suggest to try and stick to that person and see if you can get something out of it? Or do you, do you just listen to yourself and, and make a change and try and speak to someone else? If straight away, first impressions, that person's not right for you. Yeah. You'll know straight away. Yeah if that person's not going to be the person for you. Um, yeah, you just kind of got a gut feeling and yeah, you know, to move on and try someone else. So you reckon it's worthwhile just listen to that gut feeling and not try to pursue with a particular person? Yeah, I'd say if you, if you do a couple of sessions with them, well, I'd give it a couple of sessions. Mm. Um, and then, yeah, if you're not happy, mm. move on, find someone else. And that in itself is actually a pretty tough thing because you might be thinking to yourself, am I, am I the person, it's, it's something wrong with me because here I am going to see a, 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 like a health professional and this health professional is, is, has got a qualification and I'm still not feeling good. You know, what's, <laughs> what's wrong with me? And it, it's easy to feel that way. And I think it's just, you know, you got to shrug that off. You got to move on and just find, find that person for you. Yeah, you do. You just got to yeah get on with it. And, um, seek that person out you'll know once you've found the right person oh absolutely man absolutely i'm gonna um i'm gonna bring something else up it's a little bit off topic um it's it's to do with covid so 
I know the past couple of years has been really difficult for everyone, whether it be not being able to see family members, friends, you know, the inability to be able to go on holidays and then actually enjoy, enjoy, you know, your time off work or even just simple stuff like going and just, you know, going for a walk, you know, when the restrictions are uh, restrictions are, the, are at their highest. What I'm going to ask you, Scotty, is you did say that one thing that you really struggle with during, you know, the past couple of years is with COVID is dealing with having to, to change your job career. You know, how did you take that? Yeah, that was, <laughs> that was kind of interesting. Eh? Um, I guess when COVID kind of first hit and we first started hearing about it, um, I can remember talking to my colleague. Um, yeah, for those who don't know, I worked for New Zealand for a number of years. Um, yeah, I just remember talking to her and we were like, oh, this will kind of come to nothing. Um, I actually worked in the corporate travel division for Air New Zealand. So, um, yeah, we were kind of like, oh, yeah, things will be sweet. Mm. Um, and then all of a sudden, you know, like people started getting it. And then um, I was also heavily involved with um, American Express global business travel. So I was on a lot of worldwide calls um, for, you know, like integration and setup of yep. new clients. Um, and then gradually those calls started, you know, becoming less and less. And then the different regions around the world kind of, you know, started shutting down. And then our customers weren't spending because they, you know, weren't traveling. Yeah, so that, that was actually a pretty hard time. I think when we first had our, you know, the first lockdown last year, we were obviously working from home. My team, the systems team, we had a lot of project work that we were kind of going on with we'd kind of you know push stuff to the onto the back burner and left it and then um, it was a good opportunity for us to actually spend some time on the stuff that <laughs> we kind of needed to get done and out of the way yeah but I, th I don't think we ever thought that it would probably affect us here in New Zealand yeah as much as it did I think man I think honestly it, it that goes for everyone in you know the world we live in I don't I honestly don't think anyone was expecting expecting what COVID was meant to be. I know I remember sitting back in the lunchroom, hearing the news on the TV, laughing at my work colleague going, oh, here we go. The media is exacerbating another virus. Here we go. And then within a couple of weeks, lockdown was implemented. And <laughs> mate, I don't, I think it really surprised everyone. Uh, but especially for you guys and working in the, you know, working the airports, you know, flights, bookings, all that sort of stuff, it would have had such a massive impact on the, um, on that, you know, on the industry. And do you think, you know, because there's certain, certain companies that don't, won't recover out of this. Do you think fly international flights will be the same again? I don't even think it'll be the same again. Yeah. Um, there's obviously a lot of airlines that have either gone under or are fairly close to going under. But then with all these COVID restrictions now as well, I think it's going to see everyone having to have like travel passports mm -hmm. and you're going to have to be vaccinated before you can even leave the country. And yeah, it's going to, going to change the whole travel scene majorly. I think in, in one aspect it, that there are a lot of positives that we can gain out of COVID, but you know, with, with the airlines, it is, it's a massive, massive negative impact. You know, it's, it's, as you said, it's never going to be the same again. Um, and I think the restrictions are going to be so tight that if you haven't had your vaccinations, like you said, there, there will be a vaccination pass, guaranteed, 100%. Yeah, there's, no, sure. <laughs> there's no way you'd be able to get in unless you're uh, ScoMo or something. ScoMo, <laughs> yeah. ScoMo might be an exception. Um, he, yeah, he, he, he kills the virus, mate. The virus doesn't kill him. Well, that actually, <laughs> actually that, would be, that would be Chuck Norris. <laughs> um, but yeah, it's not going to be the same, but I think some positives, I think it was in China that they took a photo pre COVID and you could just see in the air, like in the, the, the air pollution was that bad that you, you couldn't see from one side of the city to the other versus now you, it's crystal clear. So I think it, I think it's actually environmentally, it's actually cleared up a lot of pollution, but then all the, you know, all the, the small things that we never we never really paid attention to like, you know, booking a flight and going overseas somewhere or like, you know, 
you know, packing up the car and travel into New South Wales for the weekend, things like that, that we never, we, we took for granted. We look at it now and we go, fuck, I wish, I wish I did more when we could. Yeah, definitely. Eh? It's kind of like, oh, we should have taken advantage yeah. of it while we could. Yeah. Um, yeah. And now you're like, oh, wish we could go traveling. And um, I guess for me, um, while I didn't lose my job with Air New Zealand, um, I decided that it was time to, to move on. Mm. Um, so that also meant giving up all my travel perks and my staff travel. Oh, mate. So, <laughs> that would, oh. yeah, it's a bit of a bugger not to have that. I now. would have been frothing, mate. That would have been that would have been a hard one to give up. Oh, it was, eh? But kind of at the end of the day, I was like, is staff travel really going to make me happy? Mm. Like, it was it was a good perk. And, I, you know, I did go around the world. But at the end of the day, it's, it's not everything either. Yeah, and... Well, because you worked in that, you because I think you mentioned to me that you you worked in in that particular industry for quite an extensive period of time. Yeah, all up, um, I was with the New Zealand for about nine years. Wow, three and, different roles. Man, it'd be so hard to like make the because you're so you, you're you're so comfortable in that field that to be able to identify, look, I need to make a change because where the airline industry is at right now it's not a good place and I need to find somewhere else where I can actually get some stability. You know, it, it's, it, it'd be so hard to actually make that change. It was pretty hard. Yeah. But I guess I kind of saw like people started getting made redundant. A lot of people that I was quite close to as well and had worked with for a number of years. And then like two people, I think in our systems team ended up being made redundant. Mm. And to be honest, that, that shouldn't have happened. They'd been there a lot longer than I'd been there. <laughs> yeah, I was the one staying. Yeah, but then I think we started to see sense as well. Like we could see that COVID was going to hang around for a while. Mm, yeah. And that working for an airline was ideally not the best thing. <laughs> so, yeah, it was kind of like, okay, I've got to get out of here. I've got to go and, you know, find something else. Even if it's not something that I, you know, I necessarily wanted to do, mm. but I was like, I need a little bit of stability and some money coming in. Oh, absolutely! You know, money, money is always a driving factor. You know, you don't have to to earn big incremental amounts of it, but you need something. You can't you can't be living in a tent for the rest of your life. I mean, unless you unless you want to live the life of like the bag, you know, bear grills or something like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Oh God, mate! I I don't know. If I, I don't know how he does it, honestly. Look, I mean, <laughs> he's an it, interesting one, eh? It looks it looks good from you know from the perspective of sitting down on the couch, you know, having popcorn or something like that. But <laughs> actually being out in his environment, you know, sleeping in probably negative ten degrees, just chucking on the the dax and and just you know hoping for the best, mate. I don't know how he does it. Yeah, nah, it's not my thing, eh? <laughs> <laughs> Look, Scotty, it, it sounds like everything you've been through, it actually does encapsulate that, that the title of this episode of Roll With The Punches. You know, you, you've acknowledged this. Go, if we go back to, to some of the things you've experienced, so, you know, with testicular cancer, it, it, wasn't a diff, it was a difficult thing to go through at the time. But you, you acknowledge that, you know, you, you found out that you had it, you, 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 act, you know, you put action to, to, this, to the situation and you know you're a better person for it now because you're probably you're probably more inclined to check yourself out when you feel you don't feel right because we all know for a fact that it doesn't take someone else to to tell us that we don't feel right we know for a fact that we know what is right is right you know what i mean like we know when we're not feeling right yeah exactly and i think having been through the whole cancer thing like i'm almost like hyper aware of it now so yeah. any little thing i'll be like okay off to the doctor but it's, it's the thing it's probably better off to be over cautious than under cautious you know you, you're not burning bridges by having to to see the doctor maybe a couple more times a month versus maybe once every six or seven months because you don't want to be that sort of person there's nothing wrong with that no nah, exactly if, if you're feeling sick go and get it checked out yeah, exactly, man. Like, we, 
I, I just get sick of it. I honestly get sick of the stigma. Like we, we feel men don't think we can, we can do this stuff. And, you know, for women as well, women, women, you know, shrug off stuff. And it's just like, what I, you know, when you have conversations with some people that, that hold this sort of mentality and you chat to them and they, and you see that look at their leg and they, and you go, you know, what happened to your leg? You've got a massive graze. Oh yeah, it should be right, mate. Or, you know, or a girl's going out one night and she's had a big night and fallen over. You know, she's got the biggest high. She's got the biggest hills on in the body, body world. Um, <laughs> <laughs> she's going out. She's had a bit of a stumble and grazed her leg. And, you know, it's probably worse than what it is, but she's just shrugging it off going, nah, I don't care about it. It'll be right. I don't, what's with this mentality? Yeah, it's an interesting thing, eh? Um, I guess I was that person once. Mm. <laughs> But yeah, having been through what I've been through, now I'm like, okay, there's no reason to kind of like sit here and kind of not go get it checked. I think, you know, I could quite easily have done that with the whole testicular cancer thing and just, you know, sat on it. But yeah, I was kind of lucky I did something when I did. Yeah, wouldn't leave anything else either now, now that I've been through that. Yeah, it just take, it takes, it takes one thing to then start to get the ball rolling and, and that feeling of, oh, like it actually wasn't that bad that I actually went and got help. It's like you're kind of feeding to the cause by not doing anything about it. And then all the, the external voices that are judging you or laughing at you because you've gone and actually put action to a certain feeling that you don't feel right within yourself or your a muscle ache or whatever it may be. Essentially, if you're not doing anything about it, it's like sitting on a park bench feeding, feeding chips to birds, mate. Like yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? you mean. You know what I mean. Like you're responding the way that they want you to respond. You know, the moment you just kind of close off and don't take any notice as to what they're saying or the way they're acting out is the moment they'll actually target somewhere else. And they'll be go, "Oh, there's another guy at a park bench. Let's go find him, and he's got bigger chips." Yeah. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> yeah, like they'll get sick of it after a while. In the summaries, if people, you know, withhold this mindset of nah, she'd be right. I'm not going to get checked up. I, I'm fine. You know, got a couple of lumps in the leg, but they'll get, they'll go away in a month's time. How do you remove that mindset? I know I kind of expressed it just then, but for yourself, having gone through something quite traumatic and potentially life-threatening, what would you say and suggest to do? I guess, yeah, just, just push through it, eh? And do what you kind of feel right and mm. so what you're kind of saying is is walk your own path and and if one thing helps someone else it doesn't it doesn't necessarily mean that'll be the right thing for you i think it's more or less kind of it's more or less feeling what's right for you and acting upon that feeling you know as soon as you've done something and you go oh that actually worked you you then explore that option and you just follow that you know you you veer in that sort of direction yeah exactly um yeah, I think, yeah, that's probably pretty spot on, eh? Don't yeah, let yeah. anyone else kind of influence you and, yeah. But I also think that, you know, even if you open up to your mates, you sometimes have to go through, you know, like talk to a couple of different mates before yeah. someone will understand Yeah. as well. Like that's something that, you know, I really struggled with and I actually lost a, a quite a large chunk of my friends when I was going through, especially the depression side of things. Mm. So yeah, just remember that, you know, one of your friends, while they kind of may want to help, they might not know how to, but don't let that be a reflection on you. It's probably because at that point in time, they may have not experienced the feelings and emotions that you were feeling or that were being heightened because of a certain situation. So that way they couldn't have that relatability, so that sense of relatability. So their way of reacting is, oh, I'm sorry to hear that, you know, um, or they go out and have a drink and, and that's that's their version of let's get over it, let's have a good time. Whereas it might be a factor of reaching out to your mates that have sort of gone through something where they've felt the similar emotions where so that way there is a bit of understanding and then kind of talk and vent about whatever you're going through. Yeah, exactly. I think, um, yeah, just talking to two mates that, you know, have, have a good understanding of it or are at least willing to learn because yeah. everyone can learn about it, you know, about mental illness and depression. 
yeah, I had a, had a couple of friends that were kind of like, they didn't even want to know about it. Mm. You know, like they had the opportunity to learn, but yeah, don't hang around those people. Like, yeah, if they're no good for you, just get far away from them and go and hang out with people that, you know, actually want to accept you for who you are and, um, and they're willing to help you get through, you know, one of the hardest times of your life. Exactly, man. You know, you can you can hang around certain people and, you know, they might be the popular group and you're trying to boost, you know, your social sort of stature. But are they the sort of people that when you really need them at your darkest of times, are they going to actually sit down next to you and, and have those bigger conversations? Yeah, the other ones that run away, eh? Yeah, like, absolutely. They're never to be heard from again. <laughs> exactly, mate. You would be feeding them chips. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, one thing that I just want to, I want to just delve into before we end this episode, I'd be curious to know, I know you said that you used a breathing exercise when you went through a psychologist and you found that helped you. Was there anything else that you are still using to this day that might be useful for, for other people that might be tuning in that may be experiencing certain mental health symptoms? Um, yeah, breathing is definitely a big one for me. Um, I think exercise is the other mm. the other big thing for me. Probably when I first started going through depression and you know, I was feeling really anxious and not in a good spot, I wasn't getting a lot of exercise. Mm. So I've never really been a sporty person. But yeah, I did find that actually getting into the gym and making sure I go and do, you know, exercise four or five days a week. Um yeah, that definitely helped. All those little things that, you know, wind you up and and really get to you all of a sudden don't matter when you're in, you know, in that state. And you may only need to go for like a walk for like 30 minutes or something, but yeah, just get moving and yeah, it'll definitely help you. So mate, get moving, get kicking, move on from the certain things that maybe, you know, hold you back and become a better person for it. Yeah, for sure. Eh? Look, it's been a great conversation, Scotty. What's the? Uh, I was going to say your your bed mate. Is that a is that a queen or a double or? That's a queen. <laughs> <laughs> mate, you get it. Get the uh, get your mattress and make your mattresses. <laughs> no, but mate, I really appreciate you taking up your time just to share a bit of a background on on your story, what you've been through, just so that way people can actually feel that if if they've experienced something is potentially terminal as you've gone through or they've gone through times of doubt or anxiety or depression that they're not alone. And that, you know, there are people out there that you can talk to. They might not necessarily be the right fit at the start, but you've got to keep searching and to find that right person for you. You know, it's a brave thing to be able to openly talk about this stuff, especially with the fact that I'm going to be publicly, you know, posting this. So thanks again, man. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for having me on. eh? Anytime, anytime, mate. But this has been season three, episode five of Couch in the Mind, clearing the mind one couch, talk at a time. And on today's episode, it had Scott Martin joining me in conversation. And we were talking about the topic of roll with the punches. Anyways, guys, have a great rest of the week. And uh, as, as usual, if you need anything, just hit me up on the Couch in the Mind Facebook page. Catch you later.